You know, so the atheists that don't believe are lobbying against the movie because it's all in their face. It's kind of like when they, st they stoned Stephen in the Bible. The Bible says that they began to stuff up their ears because Stephen looked up and said, I see the Son of God standing on the right hand of the Father. So they want to stop up their ears and uh, there's a fit going on right now. These guys are saying they, they pass it and seeing these little crosses on the side of the road. They said it, it, it's causing them to have anxiety. So they want the crosses. That's like when somebody die yeah. and they put crosses on the side of the road. There are a group of people that are saying when they pass those crosses, they begin to have anxiety. So they're going to uh, the, the, the law, the courts, trying to have these crosses removed from the side of the road because they're having anxiety. Because guess what? Christ is real. And the cross of Calvary torments the devil. Yeah. Amen. You ought to say hallelujah. The yeah. cross of Calvary torments the devil. Yeah. You know, so people that don't want to hear about Jesus and don't want to hear about sin and don't want to hear about the blood, you know, it's just torment. It should not be torment to a believer. These are words of refreshment. Amen. 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 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Um, it's uh, 11 oh something. And, uh, you know, we're just going to jump in the word. Thank you so much, Pastor Ron, you and your wife for that word. God bless you. Uh, we really appreciate you for being here today. And uh, I just want to let you know everything that you said is so prophetic. You know, God always showed me that I'm on the right track. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you in this place. We glorify your name. We thank you that you are the King of kings, that you are the Lord of lords. There is none like you, Lord. Lord, we ask you that you would be our teacher in this place, that you would reveal those things which we knoweth not, and that we may come into a place of perfect understanding. May we be everything that you've designed for us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give you all praise, all honor, and all glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to go to Luke 5, Luke chapter 5. Uh, we're going to read a few scriptures here, here in Luke 5, verse 1 through 7. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. I want you to know you can just signify by saying amen. amen. You know, as you're turning, I just want to call to your attention something. You know, it's amazing that when we, we take a stand for Christ in our society, we're like the odd man out. It shouldn't be like that in the church circle. When we take a stand for Jesus Christ, it's like we're the, we're the sore thumb. But not only the sore thumb to the world, but the sore thumb in the church. When we preach righteousness, holiness, and the truth of God, it's not per se the world has a problem with us. We know the world has a problem. It's the people that are supposed to be people of God that has a problem. And so, Lord, we pray that you would reveal those things that cause us to be in a place that we are intermingled with things that are not of you and people that are not of you. May the line be drawn and may everything be exposed. May we know who and what is of God and what's not of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's my prayer right now. God, give us discernment. Give us discernment to know who we're walking with. Give us discernment to, to, to know the people that we are linking arms with. The Bible says, how can two walk together except we be in agreement? All right? And so we're going to walk together. We're going to walk in arms link. Let's be in agreement. Amen? Are you guys cold? Y'all a little chilly? Everybody a little chilly? Brother Chuck, can you adjust that, uh, the air, please? Brother Chuck or TD, one of you guys, Pastor Sonny, anybody? You know, we probably need to move it up to about 71. Don't burn us up, man, because it's going to get hot again in a second. Amen. Amen. Your blood going to start to boil in a second. Hallelujah. Luke 5, verse 1 through 7. I'm going to read this, and we're going to move over. Uh, we're going to deal with uh, John chapter 21. John chapter 21. But this is the foundation of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, let me go ahead and read these scriptures. It says here in Luke chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret. 
and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone. They were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Lunch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a drop, or a big catch. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have tall all night. I want you to get that. We have tall all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done, when, when they had uh, this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, or fish, and their nets break, or their nets were breaking. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and they filled both the ships so that they begin to sink. Let's go over to John 21. I'm going to go ahead and read this because we, 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 we're going to, man, we're going to hit this thing today in Jesus' name. Amen. John 21. John 21, verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on the wise, he, uh, on the wise showed he himself uh, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel and Cain, of Cana in Galilee, and the son of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with you. They went forth, and they entered into the ship immediately, and that, not, and that night they caught nothing. And when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto the children, Have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. That they cast therefore, excuse me, they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. I love this scripture. It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it was two hundred cubic dragons, the net with fish, as soon as as soon as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus said unto them, uh, bring of the fish which you have have now caught. Simon Peter went up and he drew the net to the land full of great fish and a hundred and fifty three fish. And for all there were so many, yet were, yet was the net not broken. The net was not broken. Today we're going to start dealing with a subject title, Nothing But Net. Nothing but net. Um, I've read two different stories to you. If you go back and you read in the Bible, in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 5, the whole concept of chapter 5 here deals with Jesus Christ initially introducing himself to the disciples in the selection stage. Right? In the stage of selecting them. In the stage of picking them to, to be disciples. You know, Peter uh, was a fisherman. John and his brother, they were fishermen. These guys, this what this is what they did for a living. You know, this was something that was that they, they were not unfamiliar with uh, uh, the, 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 the whole concept of what it is to be a fisherman. They weren't they weren't they weren't unfamiliar with that in the natural. And the Bible says that Jesus showed up here in Luke 5. Jesus showed up, and when Jesus showed up uh, to these young men, they, they, were, they were washing their nets because they had not caught anything. 
They, they had fished all night, but they had not caught anything. And Jesus Christ shows up to some professional fishers, fishermen. They were professionals. They, they, they were good at what they were doing. They had been doing it for a number of years. And Jesus showed up at the point of their life where they fished all night and they didn't catch nothing. What a place to show up. They had fished all night, but they had not caught anything. Now, the Bible tells us in the gospel according to Mark 16, you should know this scripture. One of the commandments or one of the the, 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 the charges that Christ gave the church was that we ought to go into the world and preach the gospel. You heard the man of God say that. It's our responsibility to go into the world and preach ye the gospel unto all nations. That's what we're supposed to be doing, right? All right. So we understand the whole concept when Jesus shows up at this junction in these gentlemen's life they did not know Jesus. They didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus showed up as an anonymous individual. But he was anonymous anointed. Right? Let me say that again. He was anonymous anointed. Meaning that he was different than everybody else. When Jesus speak, his voice is different than any other voice that you ever hear. Alright? And so we see here in the word of God that while these guys pulled in these empty nets out, out, out of their profession, the Bible says here, it says they were washing their nets, and he entered, he entered into one of the ships, which was Peter, and he prayed or he told him that he would he, he, he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people out of the ship. Jesus began to teach them out of this ship. He said, Now when he had late, when he had left speaking, he said to Peter, or Simon, lunch out into the deep and let down your nets for a big catch. Lunch out into, now Jesus is giving instructions to individuals that were professionals. I want you to just follow me a little bit. This thing is going to develop. It's going to develop and we're going to, we're going to get to where we're going. You know? But, but what God wants us to see here is that Jesus was in total control. Right? You know, sometimes as, as human beings, we, we can be so control minded. You know, we're used to holding the stern wheel. You know, I mean, none of us, especially if you're a driver, you don't like getting on the passenger side. And when you get on the passenger side, you have a problem with trying to correct who's ever driving because you've got a driving spirit. All right? So the first thing that these guys had to do, they had to yield to the authority of somebody who they really didn't even know. Right? They had to yield to his authority, and they had to listen to what he was saying. I want you to lay hands on your ears, and I want you to say, Lord, help me to listen. Come on, we're going somewhere with this. Help me to listen, God. Help me to hear you the way you want me to hear you. I, I don't want to hear the way I want to hear. I want to hear the way you want me to hear. All right? That's what I've been praying. Lord, help me see what you want me to see, and help me hear what you want me to hear. Because you can create your own story. Right? You can create your own world around you. You know, you, you can have certain thoughts that are put together that build a world of make-believe in, inside of you, and, and it's not even God's will. I, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be in a fantasy world. You know, I don't want to be like the girl on Frozen that I flee to the mountains and I build me a palace, and that's not really where I'm supposed to be anyway. Come on, somebody. Help me up in this place. You know, many of us, we are avoiding our destiny because of abnormalities that we've not yielded to God so he can fix your issue. Wow. I want you to say, Lord, fix my issue. Lord, fix yeah, God know you messed up, and God know you got some things that are out of kilter in your life, but if you stay at the feet of Jesus a little longer, he'll fix your issue. Yeah. Many times we move before we're fixed. We move before we're healed. And God want to heal you. He know that you got a mental issue. God know that you got a physical problem. God know that you can't function with people without being controversial. God knows these things. But somebody say, I want to listen this time. I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend another 40 years going around the mountain. I want to listen this time, God. I don't have another 40 years to give. I want to hear you this time. 
Let me tell you something. When God tells you to do something, most of the time it's going to kick against the grain of what everybody else thinks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so, so Jesus told him, he said, I want you to, to take your organization, because that their ship was their organization. I want you to take your organization, your structure, and I want you to launch it out back into the same lake, into the same ocean. I want you to launch it back, go to the same spot. All right? He said, he said, I want you to let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answered, and he said unto him, Master, we have tall all the night. You see that? We have tall all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. At your word, I will let down the net. What did he say? You know, if you go read it in Matthew's gospel, it said that Jesus came around and he was going to make them fishermen of men. You read in Mark 1, it says Jesus was going to make them fishers of men. And now we see in Luke's gospel that the Bible tells us that they are addressing Jesus in a different way here. They said, at your word, the details that we are speaking about, you can't find them in any other gospel. But you see it in the book of Luke. And he said, at your word, we'll listen to you. I want you to repeat after me, and I want you to say, Lord, at your word, I'll do whatever you say. Don't allow people to talk you out of what God has for you. Don't allow people to poison you with their thoughts and their theories and their ideas. I want a God idea. I don't want a word from man. I need a word from God. You know, people try to critique us and people try to tell us what they think and their ideas. And, you know, many, many people don't mean any harm. But I want to know from God's perspective, don't, don't be used as a tool of the enemy to lead me away from my destiny and my purpose. Just because you don't understand what God is doing in your life, don't complicate and mess up mine. I'm preaching better than you saying amen up in here. Because it's time for us to take the blinders off. It's time for us to come out of this stone mentality to where you can't see to the left or to the right. God said, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. But guess what? When you get into the spirit, you have vision. You can see all around you. You don't have to look to the left and you don't have to look to the right. Keep your eyes on God. You can be in a whole other world and not even know you're looking behind you. Did you hear that? When you're in the spirit, God has given you the ability to see beyond everything. You know? Did, did you get that? When you're in the spirit, you can see what's around you. So when we say don't look to the left and don't look to the right, it doesn't mean that you can't see in the spirit to the left and you can't see to the, in the spirit to the right and it doesn't mean you can't see behind you. Because when you have spiritual sight, you see around you. And for me, to be able to see around you, the last time I checked, a circular diameter is around. It's not a square. It's not a left. It's not a right. It's all around you. The Bible said, Lord, let your, David said, let your angels be encamped around me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. So, when we see this, he said, we've called all night. And we've caught nothing. Let's pause here. How many of us have done it our way and at the end of the day you've come back with nothing? Come on, let's, let's, let's allow the rubber to meet the road. Am I too loud? Is this too loud? Let the rubber meet the road in your life. We got to come out of denial. We got to come out of the place to where we've allowed ourselves to fake ourselves out. You got to come to an agreement and an understanding. You've been broke your whole life. You got to come to a place that your marriage has been jacked up your whole life. You got to come to the understanding that guess what? You've been you've been been drenched in dysfunction your whole life. Yeah, you've been saved, but guess what? Your life has been dysfunction. You've been abnormality. You've been abnormal. Everybody around you've been jacked up. And you've seen glimpses of what you call success that's not really success. And do you really want to be happy in the Lord? Do you really want things to be right? Do you really want the great marriage? Do you really want things to be the way God wants them to be for you? 
So it's time for us to make God decisions. It's time for us to make God decisions. What does that mean? When God speaks to you, don't respond out of your flesh. Respond out of your spirit. And say, yes, Lord. Is there a yes in the building? Yes. You know, God is not going to tell you to do something that's popular. You know, God is not going to tell you uh, uh, to do something that everybody finds to be attractive. Amen. Like this building right in this church. You got to be led here. You know, you, you have to be led here. You know, it don't look that bad for a new church, but, you know, you got to be led here. I mean, because who want to be in a building where you got the garage window shaking over there while you're trying to hear the word? Come on. But guess what? You understand you're in the process. Amen. I mean, you're in the process. This, this ain't the type of place that, it's like the underground church right here. You know, the underground church, amen? You know, we don't have all the bells and whistles, but we got the presence. Come on, we got the presence. We got the anointing, amen? Lord God, you can do me like William Seymour. Put me in a broke down house, put me in, put my head in a box, and people are going to get healed in that place. You can have the best microphones, the best speakers. You can have the best praise and worship team with great optics and great notes, but have no presence. I want the presence, God. I want the presence. I want the anointing. That's what I want, God. I want to be in a place where you can come in and knock me out and fix me up, God. I don't want to be in some place where I'm all bougie and, you know, let's rub up against one another. You know, I got devils, you got devils. We leave with more devils. The devil is a liar. He is mother law. I want to leave free. I want to leave delivered. Amen. Amen. My God, we sit down and bump chins and, and bump gums, eating dinner. Demons coming out of you left and right. Mind gone. Children gone. Marriage gone. Money gone. Everything gone. The devil is a liar. I need God to fix me. I want to be in a fix-up environment. I want to be in an environment that's going to be conducive for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God on the inside of me. Fix my marriage. Heal my body. Change my mind. Change my children, God. Whatever you need to do, God, I want to be in that place. Amen. Amen. I remember when I played college ball, you know, a lot of these guys that were, were well gifted, you know, they came out, they didn't practice hard, and, you know, at the end of the day, they left practice early. And I noticed something, and when I say this, I'm not, I'm not saying this to be racial in any way. But I noticed something that, that was peculiar. I wonder why, like, most of these Caucasian guys, they hung out after practice and worked harder. And I said, you know, there's something up with this, man. And so guess what? I started dropping back, hanging out with them. Because some of these guys didn't have the gifting that some of the other guys have. But guess what? They work harder to get the edge because they know they have to work harder to do more. And so guess what? I fell into that class. You know, I felt like I was a pretty decent athlete. But I said, man, if I can hang out and work out with these guys, my God, I can be better. So it wasn't a racial thing, so I joined the group. And there I am after practice running tunnels with them. There I am after practice working out with them. After practice, we've worked already. And so the deal is, do you want to be better? Or are you willing to do more than what everybody else doing to get the edge? What's that saying, the early bird? Get the worm first. Amen? You got to get up. It's time to get up and do something. Hallelujah. And I just had to say that, of course, you got, you know, black people that's, you know, not as, uh, or Hispanic people that are not as athletic, whatever, they was there too. You know, but the predominant guys on my team that were there, most of them was Caucasian. And they were there hitting the eye, and I went in there, I got strong with them. I worked out with them, I ran with them, amen? Glory to God, hallelujah. So I, I, I joined the pack. And then I seen some other guys that didn't have skills like everybody else, they joined the pack too. But they taught me a valuable lesson. If you don't have what the next person have, work harder to get the edge on them. Amen. Amen. So I just felt like the Lord that I had to say that. I hadn't thought about that in 15 years, but I just felt like the Lord wanted me to say that to you up in this place today. Hallelujah. So the deal is they toiled all night, they caught nothing, and, and nevertheless, at your word, we're going to let down the net. And when they had done what Jesus said, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, and their nets were at the point of breaking. I know it says in the KJV that their nets break. But when you read in the Amplified, the nets didn't break. The Bible says here, it said that their nets was at the point that it began to break. That, that it was the point of breaking. And so now, they, they were in a place to where they listened to Christ, 
And, and the word of Christ bought them results. Right? The word of Christ bought them results. All right? But the word of Christ was so profound to bring them results. They moved their organization into a place based upon God's word. But the nets that they had, when the harvest came in, their nets couldn't hold it. Come on. Their nets couldn't hold. God released the word that was so powerful that their nets could not hold it. They pulled it in, but they couldn't hold it. Amen. Amen. We have to get to the place in the body of Christ to where we can hold whatever God throw our way. We got people come in, come out. My focus right now is to build leaders. My focus right now is to build people, to build marriages. Because guess what? Just like God has kept me for the last 14 years, he's going to keep the next person. And just like God has blessed my wife and I to have a great marriage, the next person going to have a great marriage. Amen? Amen? But guess what? We got, we got to lead by example. We have to lead by example. People come in broken, sit still long enough to let God fix you. Amen? Sit still long enough to let God do things in your life that need to be done in your life. Amen? Amen? Because guess what? You come in and give a little word, and, and, you, and you jet out, and not just this place. You come in, you give a little word, and jet out, and, and a week later, two weeks later, you, you know, you, you didn't have enough. Your nets wasn't strong enough to hold what God was sending your way. You gotta build the nets. You gotta build the nets. I don't want to walk away with nothing but net. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to walk away with something in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Is anybody getting that? Hallelujah. So, so the point of this of this whole deal of me reading this from the beginning is that this was at the beginning stage of these guys' life with Jesus. This was the beginning stage. All right. The Bible says over in Proverbs eleven verse thirty. Because we're going to tie this in to, to Mark chapter 16. We're going to tie it in. All right. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 11 verse 30 in the Amplified, it says that the fruit of the uncompromising, uh, uncompromisingly righteous is a tree of life. And he who is wise captures human lives. For God as a fisher of men... He gathers and he receives them for eternity. Now, if you read this in the, in the Amplified, and in the King James Version, it says that he that winneth souls is wise. What it says. He that winneth souls is considered to be wise. And the fruit of that life it, it, it is the picture of the bait that God uses to bring people into the kingdom. If you read in the message version, it said that a horrible life destroys a soul. Meaning that the life that you live that's contrary to God's word calls people that should be saved not get saved because the life that you live is damaging to them. The life you live is a life, a life of power, a life of substance. That's the reason it's very important that we can't be carrying on with unriotous living because somebody is watching you. Somebody that know God and somebody that don't know God. Somebody that's on the verge of breaking, but you can live a life that, that is unriotous and cause them to stumble and go away from God. We got to be strong and we got to stand strong in this day. We got to show love in the midst of hatred. We got to show love in the midst of condemnation when people are trying to condemn us and persecute us. We still have to show love. Hallelujah. Now we're going to come back to that scripture. Let's go over to John 21. John 21. Is anybody getting anything in that? I tell you, it's going to heat up. It's going to heat up. John 21. Now in John 21, what's happening here, this is, this is from John the Revelator's perspective. You know, Bishop Tudor said something last week. We were in a meeting with Bishop Tudor. And he said that the book of John is a book that out of all the gospels, it was the last gospel that was written. Said they had all the gospels. John gospel came about 75 or 85 years later after all the other gospels. He said that the reason that John's gospel went so long from manifested is because John did not start his apostolic work until late in his life. 
And the reason he didn't start to lay in his life is because he had to wait to marry the mother Jesus died. Remember when John was at the cross and Jesus said, mother, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. John was the caretaker of Jesus' mother. And John stayed with Jesus' mother until she died. And the deal was, remember the scripture here in, uh, in John 21, when he said, if everything was written about Jesus, the book itself could not contain it. Nobody else made that statement because John knew stuff about Jesus that everybody else didn't know. While he was hanging out with his mother Mary, Mary began to tell John about Jesus' childhood. She began to tell John about how Jesus was as a little boy. And so all the other disciples was not exposed to this level of teaching. And so now we hear and we see John telling this from his perspective, given inspiration by the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says here in John 21, it says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. On the wise, he showed himself. Now, I want you to see something here. You know, in, 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 in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 5, John was one of the guys that were there when Jesus Christ told them to launch the ship out into the deep. Now we see at least three, three and a half years later, all right, Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. Now we see John in John chapter 21, and we see John speaking and giving uh, uh, an account of what happened with Jesus after Jesus' resurrection. Remember, at first, they just listened to God's word, they listened to the word of God through Jesus, and Jesus Christ told them to launch out into the deep. Now we see John telling the gospel, and he's telling the gospel that Jesus Christ had died, Jesus Christ had rose from the grave, and now here's Peter saying, you know what, I'm about to go back this year. When Jesus found them, they were pursuing natural fish. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishermen of men. Remember, Mark 16 had already been spoken. It had already been spoken. Because John's book came 75, 85 years later. So they already had Mark chapter 16. When John's book was released, Mark chapter 16, which is the Great Commission, had already been spoken. And so here's John. John said that when Jesus died and rose from the grave, they were at a place to where they were discontent. They were sad. Their teacher had died. He had rose from the grave, but, but they were sad. And Jesus was showing himself. If you read in John chapter 20, the Bible said he had just showed himself to who? No, it wasn't Mary. You got your Bibles, guys. Who? Thomas. Now in Thomas. You know? He said, come touch me. Put your hand in my side. He had just showed himself to Thomas. And so now, now we hear, now, now we hear John telling this deal that Peter was like, man, I'm going back fishing. That's what they was doing three and a half years ago before they met Jesus. They were fishing natural fish. But guess what? They weren't walking out what had been given them in Mark's gospel, chapter 16, the Great Commission. He went back looking at the natural fish. Right? You got that? He went back looking at the natural fish. He said, okay, he said, we're going to go with you then. We, go, we all going to go back fishing. All right? That's what he said. He said, we all going to go back fishing. And while we're there fishing, guess what happened again? Come on, come on, guys. Preach with me. Got to make sure you follow me. Same thing happened. He came back what? Nothing but that. Guys, are you following me? <laughs> John 21, are you there? He came back in. Again. Three and a half years prior, when Jesus selected them, what happened? It came back in. It came back with them and that. And when God spoke to them, and he gave them a word, they launched out into the deep, and they began to pull in a harvest that their nets wasn't built to hold. And so now we see in John's gospel, I want you to follow me. Now we see three and a half years after being with Jesus. Three and a half years of 
after being with Jesus. There they are. Back in the same state. Come on, Jesus, help me up in this place. They're back in the same state. Matter of fact, they're in a worse state because when they didn't know Jesus, they were just in a state, we're going to go fishing the next day. Now they've lost their rabbi. Now they've lost their teacher. And the gospel that we're reading right now is gospel that should bring life into your souls. Guys, help me here. Help me here. Help me, Holy Spirit. You're going to get this thing. So the Bible says here in verse 4 of the same chapter, it says, let me read verse, verse 3. It says here, Simon Peter said unto them, I'm going fishing. They said unto him, we going with you. What, wasn't they with him three and a half years ago? Fishing? You know, they had not spent time fishing the way they were about to fish here three and a half years because they was doing ministry. They didn't have time to go fishing. Well, maybe they did. No, they didn't. That's the reason Jesus had to pray over fish and multiply fish. Because they, they, were, they were concerned about doing ministry versus fishing. Not that they didn't fish, but they weren't fishing the way that they had fished three and a half years ago. So they had reset, and they went back to do what they were doing three and a half years ago. All right? So we, everybody say we all going fishing. No. They went forth. And they entered into a ship immediately, their organization. And that night, they caught nothing. So there they are again, three and a half years later. They toiled all night. Again, they didn't catch nothing. They didn't catch anything. Somebody about to hear and catch something. They didn't catch anything. The Bible says that when the morning was now come, when the morning, when everything that's in the book is written for a reason, when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. I want you to say here with me today that guess what? My morning is about to manifest. Come on, you need to say it like you mean it. I don't know about you, but many of us, we've been in night seasons that we've tall all night and we've caught nothing. But I declare in Jesus' name that my morning is about to manifest. My morning is about to manifest. The Bible says that Jesus was standing on the shore and they didn't even know that it was Jesus. You mean to tell me they had been with Jesus for three and a half years and now all of a sudden they back in the same scenario that they were three and a half years ago. They tall all night and they caught nothing and Jesus is standing there on the shore at the breaking of the morning looking at his students. They were his students. And he said, and then Jesus said unto them, children, have you any meat? And they answered him, no. And he said unto them, Jesus, help me up in this place. He said unto them, cast your nets on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of you would think this is a misprint. You would think that this is a typo. Because now I read three and a half years prior. The same scenario is taking place again. And here's Jesus with the same people three and a half years later. They tall all night and they've got nothing. And Jesus said, what happened? He said, we ain't catching nothing. He said, how about casting your nets? On the right. You know what? I would have stopped right there. And I would have started saying, hold up. This is like deja vu. You know, I've been taken back three and a half years from now. And didn't this happen to us three and a half years ago when we didn't know Jesus? And now that we know Jesus and we walk with Jesus and we're in the same situation where we've taught all night and caught nothing? Are you following me now? We're building a case, right? I told you it's going gonna, it's gonna to come together. It's going to come together. So, so the Bible says that he told them to cast your nets on the right side and you shall find. They cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, I love this scripture, said unto Peter, it is the Lord. Peter didn't 
says the Lord. John looked at Peter and said, it is the Lord. Because I remember three and a half years ago when we were young men doing nothing, going nowhere. And Jesus showed up after we had talked all night. And Jesus gave us a word that we want to launch into the deep. The same God that gave me a word three and a half years ago is the same God that's telling me to do what I need to do right now. That's the reason I bear witness with you. Because you said two years ago, God gave you a word. And the word that God was going to build a studio and you guys are going to do TV and you had no studio, you didn't know the owner, you didn't know anything but God and God brought you to a place now you're in a studio, now you got a TV show, now things are happening because guess what, the same God three and a half years ago that called you out of darkness into his mother's life is the same God that's keeping you sane in the midst of your storm right now, seasons comes and seasons go, hardship come and hardship go but if the same God that saved you three and a half years ago is the same God that has the ability to keep you and do for you what needs to be done for you again, 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 right now. I want you to say something right now, Lord. I want somebody to say right now, Lord. See, because we forget, we forget. We forget the God that pulled you off crack cocaine. We forget the God that took heroin out your system. We forget the God that delivered you from pornography. We forget the God that delivered you from alcohol addiction, whatever your issue may be. Guess what? You just three and a half years down the road, but the same God that told you to launch in the teeth and to cast your necks the first time is the same God that's standing up the second time and say, cast your necks and go into the deep, and if you take heed to my word, you'll come back with a great harvest. Someone ought to give God praise. You ought to have a witness in your spirit. Right? The Bible goes on to say, it says that when they when they pulled the nets in, she cut out my shot. I mean, I feel the Holy Ghost. Said when they when they when they pull the nets in. The Bible says that, 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 that their nets were, were, were so full. It says that their net was so full. As soon as then as they were come to the land, they, they saw fire on coals there, and the fish laid there. There unto uh, our own bread and bread. And Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have caught now. And Simon Peter went up and he drew the net to the land full of great fish, 153 fish. For all there was so many, yet was not the net broke. Do you see anything different that from the first three and a half years now to this place, do you see anything different? The nets were breaking three and a half years ago. But Jesus Christ had indoctrinated them with enough word that that institution, that organization had enough strength to hold it. I declare in this day that every aborted spirit that has operated in the people of God, you shall not abort this mission. You shall hold this one. You shall hold this one in Jesus' name. That's somebody getting the breakthrough right now. That dream that God gave you, you shall hold this one. You shall not miscarry. I declare in Jesus' name that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. That the seed that God has sown in you, a vision, it shall come to fruition in the name of Jesus. We declare health and wholeness and vitality over you in Jesus' name. Somebody ought to give God praise in this place. You can't hang with Jesus and your nets not be better. You can't run with Christ and he not give you the ability to hold it. My God, just imagine Hannah. Hannah, you, it, it doesn't say in the Bible. Can somebody give me a napkin, a towel or something? It doesn't say. It doesn't say what happened in the Bible. But, but we do see an illustration of Hannah. Hannah was the mother of Sammy. Just imagine Hannah every year. She went up to the house of God. You know, Panaya was there poking fun because she was popping out babies like popcorn in a microwave. And I can imagine Hannah showing up on the scene and falling out before God and crying out before God and saying, God, 
I'm not the type of woman that I should be because I can't bear children for my husband, Elkaniah. I can't, I can't give him the child that he deserved, God. I can see her every year going before God, but walking her back empty. I can see her coming back every year, but walking away empty. But all of a sudden, somebody yeah. said, all of a sudden. All of a sudden, in one year, one day, one moment, she came in the house of God, prostrate, fixed before God, and began to say, Lord, I got it now. Come on, come on. I can guarantee you the prayer she prayed that was recorded. She had never prayed this prayer because guess what? Time and hardship will give you wisdom that only time and hardship can give you. So every year when she was walking back empty, she was going back scratching her head saying, Lord, what is it, God? What do I need to do God why this thing ain't producing God why are things not manifesting God and all of a sudden when she was on her way back this time the spirit of God came upon her and he said for such a time as now I'm going to change your mind and as she fell out before God the prayer was recorded and she prayed a prayer and say God I got it now if you just give me a son, I'm going to give him back to you. My God, she made a deal with God because God God wanted that firstborn. He wanted that seed that was going to come from her womb. And she said, Lord, if you give him to me, I promise I'll give him back to you so you can take care of him all the days of his life, God. And he'll be raised in the house of God. The Bible shows me that the seeds were passing by every year. When her husband had relationship with her, sexual relation, the seed was passing out like wayside. But all of a sudden, I can see Eakaniah and Hannah looking up. And my God, when that seed hit that wound, that wound locked around that seed in such a way and say, we're going to hold this one in the name of Jesus. Because we understand now. We understand that this seed is not for me. This seed is for God. And God is going to produce a man child that's going to change the course of history as we know it. The Bible said that she was so full of the Holy Ghost that uh, Eli came and accused her of being intoxicated. She was intoxicated because guess what? She was pregnant with a promise and manifestation was soon about to come. She walked away from that pregnant because God allowed that wound to hold what had been shot in it. Let me tell you something here. You may have been in a barren season. You may have been in a season of no, uh, no productivity. You may have been in a zone of no fruitfulness. But I declare in Jesus' name, allow the Lord to mend your nets. Allow God to strengthen you. Allow God to change your mind. I need you to lay hands on your head in this place and say, God, you're changing my mind. You're changing my mind, God. The way I used to think, I don't want to think like that anymore. The way I used to function, I don't want to function like that anymore. Break off my grave clothes. Unloose my hands and let my feet go. Hold my mule while I praise God. I will not stay in this season any longer. Is there anybody in here that's fighting for a new season? You're fighting for a new day. You're fighting for a new outlet. You'll be your outlook. You've been stuck for too long, but you got a revelation that God is a God of progression, and God want to move you forward. This is a new day for you. This is a new hour for you, and we can preach you out of your situation. We want to preach you out of it. God is going to give you a new organization, a new institution that you can hold this thing. I declare in the name of Jesus, and God got to give you new female organs, Sarah, so the son that Abraham is supposed to have is going to come for you can have a hundred year old wound, but we believe in the name of Jesus. If a seed for the life in a dead wound, that by God, that dead wound got to come alive because the seed got to come forth. I promise you, Isaac and Isaac shall come forth in the name of Jesus. You may laugh at me now. He moved to the West Coast. You may laugh at me now. He left his house. And he left his family. He left his house. He left his church. He left everything and went off on a limb. If God tell you to do something, you can take it to the bank, baby. Not the banks that's going to fail anyway. I'm talking about the banks of the kingdom of God. I'm talking about the kingdom currency. That's faith. That's faith. If you got faith, the size of a cream of a mustard seed, you can speak to that mountain and say, mountain, be ye uprooted and cast into the sea. I declare in Jesus' name that faith is rising. I declare in Jesus' name that we shall not be like down Thomas. We believe, Lord. We trust you, 
God. We move into our next day. We move into our next season. We declare that morning is manifesting right now. Not next week, right now. But the Bible says now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unknown. We believe in God. I'm telling you, weeping the endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I don't know about you, but the Son of God shall rise with the healing in his wings in my morning. I believe God. Is there anybody here that got a I believe in your spirit? I believe. I believe God. I believe I'll break out dancing. I believe I'll break out shouting. I believe I'll break out running, God. Because I believe. I believe that Jesus came down 42 generations and laid his life on the altar as a sacrifice and got up just like he said he would on the third day. My God, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the same power that's working on the inside of you. I want you to speak to yourself, and I want you to say, self, in the name of Jesus, you're going to act right. You're going to straighten up the stuff you've been tripping out on and causing me to miss my moment. I'm going to divorce it in the name of Jesus. I'm going to sever it in the name of Jesus. I'm moving forward into my destiny. I'm moving forward into my future. I believe God. I believe God. Put a different anointing upon me. Put a new word in my tongue. Put a new word in my belly. I believe Believe in the name of Jesus. Let me enter into the cloud like Moses did. And I'm going to come out with a scroll with ten commandments that's going to shape humanity. Is there anybody in this place that got a clear understanding that God is not dead? That he is the God of Israel. He is the God of the universe. He is the God of heaven. He is the God of earth. And every knee shall bow. And every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is the King of glory. Is there anybody here that understands the power of the blood. Is there anybody here that understands the victory of the cross? Is there anybody here that understands that demons are trembling, that angels must bow, everything must declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. Somebody ought to give him praise in this place. Come on, you ought to give him praise. Come on, you can do better than that. Praise him like you feel. We don't play the church, but we don't, we, we don't fight a pretty devil. The devil will knock your teeth out. He will give you two black eyes and take one of your limbs from you. The devil don't play fire, but my God, we stand on the word of God. He's a low-down, dirty devil. It's time for the real church to stand up. Don't worry about what the world's saying. Let's cleanse this place. Let's declare God's hand on this place so God can move to the next place in the name of Jesus. Somebody give him praise. Come on, you ought to do better. See, I want you to understand. Let me give you one more scripture and we'll stop. And this scripture comes out of Proverbs, out of Psalms 19. Psalms 19, verse 7. And I'm going to paraphrase this. God has a plan. He has a perfect plan. And in God's perfect plan, Pastor, come on. In God's perfect plan, God wants to save everybody. The Bible tells us in the book of Peter, or the epistle of Peter, it says that God's perfect will is not for none to perish, but for all to come to everlasting life. So when people say God sending somebody to hell, they lie. God don't send anybody to hell. You go to hell because you want to. Hell wasn't even created. Hell was created for Satan and his army, his army and the false prophet. Let me tell you something. The Bible says here in Psalms 19, it says that the word of God is perfect to the converting of the soul. There is, there is no blemish in God's word. There is no error in God's word. God's word is error free. And he don't care whether you believe or don't believe. It don't stop him from being God. He, go, he, he just as much God today with a believer or a believer. He's still God. The Bible says that he rides on the clouds. If he need a ride, he ride on the clouds. God do what he want to do. He say what he want to say. Because he's God. And the Bible tells us, it says that not only is God's word 
perfect or his law perfect to convert his soul. If you go a little bit farther into the next verse, I think it says something like this. It talks about, you know, the joy of the Lord. Isn't it what it talks about? The joy of the Lord. Can you see your Bible? It says that the statues of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure and they enlighten your eyes. So guess what? When God is in you, your eyes are going to be enlightened. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, it says that, he said that my prayer is that the God of Israel shall grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and he will enlighten you so that you may know what the hope of the calling is. Is that amazing? Or what? So we pray right now that God open our eyes. Because the disciples was in a three and a half year cycle. Jesus died, rose from the grave, manifested in resurrected body. They was in a place that their eyes was cut. Their eyes had started closing again. Because they said that they, 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 saw, they saw a man, but they didn't know it was Jesus. But they should have had enough discernment to know that it was Jesus. And I know there was instances, in, in, in instances that Jesus hid himself from them. What is that? 98 verse 2, they get revelation while they sit there. God speaking to them right now while we sit here. He said, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he have done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness have he openly showed in the sight of the heavens. You can sit here and you can tug and you can pull and you can fight against everything. The only thing you're doing is making life horrible for you. Because God ain't going to change. It doesn't matter how much we say, Jesus, we love you, we love you. He is a God that will not change. We have to conform to him. He's not going to conform to us. And we go around trying to, trying to, you know, make things a certain way. God's going to do what he want to do. We got to get with his program. And the sooner we get with his program, the better your life going to be. I want to encourage every person here to lay hold of that. This is only part one of nothing. I wish I could go a little deeper today, but we won't. I want you to embrace the energy. I want you to embrace the fire of what's been released here. You know, the spirit of God hit me. The spirit of the preacher hit me. That's what happened just right there. You know, it wasn't a man. Something came up. God did that. And that was for you in this place. So the spirit of God can bring you into his atmosphere. So that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. The hour is late. And God has given us March 16th. And it's our job to witness to our loved ones. And we're going to talk about that. Next week, it's our job to minister to people that we know and don't know. It doesn't matter whether they were, you can't have gotten the gospel. It's not pretty. But I got a pretty gospel. You're going to preach a pretty gospel. And all they talk about is blood and nails and spit and claws. That's, is that a pretty gospel? Kicking and clawing, knifing, putting people in the grave. Does that sound pretty? Beating somebody with a whip with nails in it? Is that pretty? That's the gospel. They spit on him. He put pulling hairs out of his face. Is that pretty? But we want pretty church. We tell the preacher, he can't preach. You want to know how revival started? It started with people that had a bird in their heart. It started with men and women of God that came out and didn't care what man thought. God, grant us a holy boldness, God. Give us fire in our soul, God. It doesn't matter who can offend you, God. As long as our souls are saved, we're catering to men and not to God. We need to repent and turn from our idolatry. This thing has become idol worship. And we're not worshiping God. We're not praising God. They don't sing, sing our favorite song. We don't want to go anymore. If the preacher don't preach the way we want him to preach, we don't want to hear him anymore. We're on our way to hell. On a fast track. And I understand it. And we ought to repent and turn from our open debauchery. Repent, repent, and turn from your sin. 
Turn from your drunkenness. Turn from your harlotry. Turn. 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 Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. People say, oh, we've been hearing that for years. Guess what? Don't get caught. Because Jesus is coming. And those that are looking for him, we're going to see him when he cracked the sky. Jesus is coming. Our Savior is coming. The man of God talked about the star reappearing. In a few days, we got a lunar eclipse going to happen here April 15th. One of the first of four that's coming. 